comfortably the international vaccine from the international vaccine institute and bill and melinda gates foundation he has been writing he has been uh, published in numerous journals we all know that covid 19 uh, has disrupted our social life today he is going to speak on a particular issue called cytokine storm and its impact on lungs covid adam please go forward thank you avid <coughs> today session uh, Go, uh, dr gausal azam khan will chair today session he is an associate professor of department of physiology physics school of medicine physi uh, he is a vis- visiting professor of university of science and technology meghalaya uh, he is an advisor scientist in the sinha institute of medical sciences and technology goria kolkata he did his bachelor of science in human physiology from university of calcutta shrinath college and master of science from university of calcutta his master <coughs> specialization was biophysics and electrophysiology under the, under the supervision of juthika kole and he got first class first in biophysics and electrophysiology and professor ak chatterjee gold medal award He did his PhD from Jadavpur University, Kolkata, Department of Life Sciences and Biotechnology, on the topic isolation and characterization of a hypoglycemic protein from goat kidney and its role in carbohydrate metabolism under the supervision of Professor Ashru Kumar Sena, DSC. His uh, area of research is. Uh, he has expertise on sterile inflammation induced insulin resistance during stress he has focused on the role of non well brand factor in the regulation of nitric oxide synthesis and and its implication in insulin resistance on glucose intolerance under stress he have also uh, shown an oral insulin formulation whose uh, pre clinical uh, pre clinical studies going on it will be a possible mode of insulin therapy in future uh, he received many national and international project funding and many academic awards and the list is quite long i am not going to this uh, he received many awards and most notable award is developing world scientist award international society of thrombosis and hematostasis japan and uh, sir uh, we are privileged to have you uh, please uh, this session is over to you now thank you thank you very much for the invitation and the sharing the session it is our great pleasure to be here uh, dr mirazul hafazi is an associate mm-hmm. professor from the university of maryland the school of medicine so he has a very long standing beautiful research career and recently they he published one article in the nature communication that is very interesting and he got the postdoctoral training from the yale university as well as john hopkins baltimore so he is expert in the epithelial transport physiology relevant to epithelial link disease you know the gout and hopefully today he is going to talk regarding the covid-19 and its inflammatory consequences which is leading to several organ damage and organ failure so dr kaji please go ahead and start your presentation okay thank you for inviting me and i you know uh, thanks for um, all the introduction and good wording 
uh, about me. Um, this is, in fact, indeed, uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be with you to present um, what I know. Uh, I should not say I am. I have the expertise in the COVID nineteen uh, field, but certainly it is a epithelial linked disease. I don't know whether you can see my screen. Can you see yes, my screen? Yes, it is visible. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, but definitely it is an epithelial linked disease, uh, meaning somehow this bug virus, um, SARS-CoV-2, interact with the most of the epithelial cells, for example, in um, lung epithelial cells and intestinal epithelial cells, kidney epithelial cells, and some other um, organs. So that's why I consider it is an epithelial linked disease. The title uh, of this talk, you can see here, the COVID-19 cytokine storm. So it is a, uh, that people think, is a disorder of cytokine storm. So cytokine, I, most of you know, as you all are, uh, or many of you probably are uh, uh, associated uh, in biological science, the cytokine basically kind of uh, secreted protein uh, by the immune cells. So when I talk about the immune cells, meaning those are the cells that are responsible for the immune response, mostly uh, lymphocytes. Uh, but at the same time, several epithelial cells uh, also secrete the cytokines, and they are responsible for certain signaling or immune response or immunity response uh, for the benefit of the host to uh, read off uh, the infection. If it is not, if it's dysregulated, that's happening in COVID-19, then uh, disease can ensue. For example, here in COVID-19. So I think uh, many of us now are very much familiar with this disease and the virus that are responsible for this disease called coronavirus. Before like December 2019, people even don't know about what is corona. But now I think, you know, it is very much common, very common people now know what it is. It is a coronavirus, right? So we also, many of, I mean, most of us probably um, experience uh, of common cold. That's also caused by this coronavirus, not certainly not by COVID-2, uh, sorry, the SARS-CoV-2, but definitely by other uh, coronavirus. So this virus, basically, as you can see from this uh, first slide, uh, that interact with a uh, SC2, which is a converting enzyme, and you can see converting enzyme uh, protein that does express by the epithelial cells, and where they where this virus interact with uh, to get access to the inside of the cells because virus generally do not uh, uh, do not survive outside the cells outside the living organism. So they always look for uh, living things, living cells, where they can um, live and uh, replicate and stay for their own survival. Most of the uh, things I'll be talking today, but I have limited my slides, only 12 slides. Otherwise, I'm very sure that most of you uh, will, uh, you know, fall sleeping. Um, uh, so that I do not want to make it happen. So that's why I wanted to make my uh, slides very limited. Only 11 or 12 slides I'll be sharing with you. Uh, let me bring this uh, background information. Uh, I am very sure that many of you know that in December 2009, the outbreak of the novel coronavirus disease, which is called 19, so that's the name of the disease, in China that spread worldwide almost to 140 other countries which is becoming an emergency of major international concerns. Uh, anyway, so if you have any question, please do not uh, you know, hesitate to ask me anytime. You can stop me, and I will try my level best to answer you if I know about it. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection causes cluster of severe respiratory illness, similar to severe acute respiratory syndrome, called SARS coronavirus. Uh, phylogenetic analysis shows that the SARS-CoV-2 is a new member of the corona uh, uh, 
variety family but is distinct from other two uh, sorts of virus called SARS-CoV, which is uh, approximately 79% uh, similar. And with MERS-CoV, the SARS-CoV is 50% um, uh, similar according to the nucleotide sequence. So very much clear that the SARS-CoV-2 is distinct from other two uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV responsible for other epidemic disease that happened in 2002 and 2012, I guess. Um, and the transmission generally happened from human to human via droplet, as you can see from the right-hand corner of the slide, how does it happen? And it also, this transmission also happened through contamination uh, from hands or as described, but you know, many other things can happen still, people don't know. And the incubation times um, for the infection is two to 14 days. And the early diagnosis, quarantine, and the supportive treatments are essential to cure pest, uh, patients as well as to limit the infection um, from COVID-19. Uh, now let me talk about a little bit coronavirus. Most of you know, just three bullet points I have. So basically, coronavirus's name or the crown-like spikes are shown here um, as a red color. Uh, so it is a Latin word corona, means crown, which is a positive sense RNA viruses that belongs to the coronavirus subfamily. And this virus has a, uh, uh, has a genetic material called a single standard RNA, which code all those structural protein as shown here, like membrane protein, spike protein. That's the one important uh, protein that causes the immune response or uh, the disease. Uh, it, and this is a protein responsible for binding with receptor, as I mentioned earlier, ACE2, that does express in the intestinal epithelial cells, uh, in the most of the epithelial cells. And what they have found, the scientists have found that there are a lot of mutation happen in this spike protein that make them very, uh, uh, very dangerous uh, for their infectivity. Uh, to human. So until December 2019, only six different coronaviruses were known to infect human. And four of these are shown here, like HCOV, NL63, HCOV 229E, HCOV OC43, and HKE1. So that usually caused mild common cold type symptoms. Other two, the SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV have caused uh, pandemics in, 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 the, uh, in, in 2002 and 2012. Uh, I think many of you know about it. And now the origin of SARS-CoV-2. All coronaviruses that have caused disease to humans have had animal origins, generally either in bats or rodent. Interesting thing, um, if you, if you, uh, I think you know about it that the bat really is a reservoir of the many viruses, almost 130 kind, different kinds of viruses found in bats. Then the question, why do so many infectious disease emerge from bats? And you might be wondering, why are not the bats themselves affected by the viruses? It turns out, our uh, scientists know that bats have developed a special immune system to deal with it. And their system do not overreact to infection, which keep, keeps them from falling ill from the many viruses they carry. However, human does, our immune system overreacts to several uh, viral infections. So because of this overreaction of our immune system, uh, 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 then we are now suffering from a uh, kind of uh, uh, cytokine storm disorder, like our body produces an uh, numerous, I mean, abundant amount of cytokines. Cytokines are uh, sometimes very uh, beneficial as well as uh, they are dangerous to our body if, if we are not controlled by our immune system. That's happening in COVID-19, and we'll be talking about uh, in the case of SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, 
uh, these, these two coronavirus were transmitted directly to human from, from the civet cats and also from camels uh, respectively. So basically what I mean to say here that the SARS-CoV and the MERS-CoV, they generally jump from bats to seabed cats and camels. And then from camels and cat that they jump to the humans and then causes those uh, two um, uh, epidemic in, uh, uh, in Middle East and other uh, places. Uh, in 2019, while SARS-CoV-2 was likely transmitted to the human through pangolins that are illegally sold in Chinese market. So what does that mean? That somehow these cov 2 somehow jump from bat to pangolin. And then you know, from pangolin to human probably happened uh, in, uh, uh, in, in China and then uh, with, over time, it uh, spread across the world in different countries. But uh, I think you may remember there was some early speculation that SARS-CoV-2 emerged from a man-made manipulation of an existing coronavirus, but it's very sure there is no such evidence to support such a theory. It has been reported by the um, American scientific community published by later to the National Academy of Science uh, Journal, clearly saying there's no evidence that support that it was a man-made manipulation. There is no support. It basically came from, uh, you know, bat and then jumping to the pangolin and from pangolin to human. So this is the, about the origin of the current SARS virus, I mean, SARS-CoV virus, SARS-CoV-2. If there is any question, you can ask me at this point. Now, I'm going to uh, take you to the mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, meaning the entry to the target cells. As I mentioned, that the target of SARS-CoV-2 is to the epithelial cells. So when they get into uh, uh, our body, uh, either through respiration um, or through um, uh, oral fecal um, uh, transmission is still not clear whether it's happened like that way, but very much sure that the transmission happened uh, through, uh, through the respiratory system when you are very close to an infected person. So most of the SARS-CoV virus, when they get into our respiratory system, they generally stay, uh, stay on the upper respiratory tract. They generally do not go into the deeper all the way down to our lower respiratory system, which is uh, different from uh, SARS-CoV-2. While SARS-CoV-2, when getting to our respiratory system, they have the ability, they can go all the way down to the uh, alveoli or the lower respiratory system where they feel comfort to interact with the epithelial cell, as you can see from the upper right uh, picture, those are the epithelial cells uh, uh, lying in our, in our alveoli. So when SARS-CoV-2 get into our respiratory system, they can walk down all the way to the alveoli as shown here and they can interact with um, the epithelial cells and then they try to get into that epithelial cells through the receptor called SE2. As shown here, when they interact with the AC2 receptor, and then there is a protease that is produced by our body to activate this interaction um, and to cleave uh, this AC2 receptor, and the spike protein is then activated. So those are the spike protein. That's why it is called uh, 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 the crown-like structure that I mentioned earlier. And that's why it is called um, coronavirus. Uh, so cleaved SE2 then, this receptor, uh, and activated the spike protein that facilitate the entry of the virus into our cells, the epithelial cells. And then uh, they 
basically release their genetic material inside the cells for their own benefit uh, to replicate and then increase their own number. And then they try to then get out from that infected cells to infect other cells, other um, organs, and definitely through their circulation. So that's the very easy way to describe how this virus get into our cells, multiply, and then infect other cells. And then uh, they trigger uh, the, our immune system. And the inflammatory cascade then is initiated by our immune cells called ant antigen-presenting cells. Many of you know that there are different kinds of antigen-presenting cells, one of them like dendritic cells. So their job is always to, uh, to monitor if there is any foreign particles, foreign body, or any virus, bacteria, try to invade our body. Once they found it, what they do, they encounter, they try to read them off. If they are not able to do it, what they do, they then refer to other immune cells like T lymphocytes to tell them that I'm not going able to do it. Please take care of me. Then there are, uh, then they, uh, uh, their sing uh, signaling system is activated, then they secrete certain cytokines. That cytokines have to differentiate more uh, uh, immune cells, like different kind of T lymphocytes to tackle this uh, uh, and the bugs by producing some uh, bad uh, cytokines, good cytokines to, uh, uh, to take care of it. So that I'm come into in, in a second. Uh, so the, before going to get into the air, which organ are most severely damaged by SARS-CoV-2? I'm very sure you all know is about that's our um, our lung. So uh, because the more uh, the major entry uh, that happened through lung, and lung expresses the receptor SD2 lot than any other epithelial cells. So the lung at the primary site of injury by SARS-CoV-2 infection, which causes COVID-19, the name of the disease, and the virus reaches the lung after entry in the nose or probably mouth. It is debatable, but it's very sure through the nose. So let me uh, give you a little bit, you know, remind or refresh your uh, uh, knowledge about the uh, lung. So if you look at the lung uh, physiology, you'll see the trachea, and then is further divided into uh, bronchus and then um, uh, secondary bronchus, tertiary bronchus, smaller bronchus, and then all the way down to the alveoli. So that I mentioned that the SARS-CoV-2 has the ability to go all the way to alveoli, where they found that that's the better place to live, to multiply, to survive there, but not other SARS uh, virus like uh, uh, most of most of the virus that uh, SARS virus, uh, SARS CoV virus, are responsible for uh, common cold. But these virus can do this. They can reach to the alveoli, and then they affect the alveoli, and then produce like triggers the immune response. And then what happened that the alveoli is flooded with a lot of fluid, results edema. When edema happens then our alveoli not able to uh, transport gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide. Therefore, our lung then struggle to provide uh, more um, oxygen to the blood. As a result of that, um, and then we are suffering from ARDS, called Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome due to the cytokine strong. So as I mentioned that it can infect the entire respiratory system all the way down to millions of tiny air sacs like this. If you look at this, those are the air sacs surrounded by all those um, uh, circulatory system, uh, pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, as you can see here, where most of the gaseous exchange happened between alveoli and the blood. Uh, so the alveoli, the physiological function of the alveoli literally keep people alive by bringing oxygen 
into the bloodstream and excreting carbon dioxide. But the SARS-CoV-2, as I mentioned, disrupt this, uh, uh, this exchange, gaseous exchange of uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen between alveoli and the blood. So that's happening in, in COVID-19. So when the virus particle enters the alveoli, they continue to replicate and injuring the lung. That's happened, that's uh, very basic. Uh, what are the pathogenic features of SARS-CoV-2 when they get into the alveoli? That I'm going to talk about now. Inside the alveoli, there are immune cells called macrophages as shown here, um, which act as uh, sentinels, meaning they're always uh, doing surveillance, always keep monit monitoring whether any invader or foreign particles or bacteria virus getting into the respiratory system or lung. And when they recognize this danger, then as I mentioned earlier, that they always try to get rid of it. That's the first uh, different systems we have in our body. It's called innate immune system. So these macrophages attack the virus. So a battle that the immune system sometimes wins, sometimes not. If your body needs more help, as I mentioned, it recruits more immune cells like T cells or like neutrophils, you know, to tell them, you know, I'm not able to do it. Please help me. So then they are, I'm going to take care of it by producing uh, or, um, uh, or or by, uh, by activating our immune system. So once um, macrophage is not able to read off this uh, virus, they then refer that uh, danger signal to other uh, immune cells as shown here, T cells mostly. There are variety kind of T cells. And once they communicate with this macrophage, then these T cells get activated by secreting several kinds of cytokines. And that cytokines also have to divide uh, these T cells for, for producing more different kinds of T cells to, uh, uh, to, to defend this uh, virus. Sometimes the virus take different, um, uh, different mechanism uh, to, to, uh, uh, to tackle uh, our immune system. Uh, as a result of that, then our cytokine, our body cannot uh, able to uh, tackle uh, or to regulate, to stop, to produce more, uh, more cytokines. As a result of that, we have then a huge abundance of different kinds of cytokines that call cytokine strong. As you can see here, this is the paper came out, the first paper came out in Lancet. Uh, this year, in sometimes in, I think, March or April, when they look at, I think it is very hard for you. I tried to blow it up, but, you know, it didn't work, and I'm sorry for that, but here you can see the panel. lot of cytokines, starting from interleukin 1, B, 2, 4, 5, 6, several cytokines level increase in ICU patient, meaning patient who, who's, uh, who are, like, severely affected due to uh, uh, SARS CoV infection compared to healthy control. So, a huge number of cytokines level increase uh, uh, in, in our blood due to infection. That's called uh, the cytokine storm. Then, how this cytokine storm, uh, cytokine storm uh, actually uh, uh, inhibit the normal breathing uh, that just I mentioned. Uh, a few moments ago, the exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen. So our body always need oxygen. That comes from the alveoli to the blood. And our body, so different mechanism, metabolic mechanism, all those things, produces carbon dioxide that we should, our body should eliminate from the blood. Uh, that generally happen from the blood uh, to the alveoli, and then it get out of our body. So that's that is very much in, that is very much interrupted uh, due to SARS uh, cov infection by producing a lot of cytokine storm that I'm going to take you now. So here on this picture you can see how cytokine storm can uh, really affect the alveoli, results the accumulation of the fluid, flooding of the alveoli. 
So in general, uh, so what happened is there are two things. One is attack from the virus, and other is the overreaction or immune system makes or uh, coronavirus so deadly or uh, the disease really so deleterious to us because of the because of the two things one is attack from the virus that triggers our immune system and our body not able to control that uh, inflammation as a result of that we have abundance amount of cytokine called cytokine storm so what happened in a worst case of scenario the wall of the alveoli begin to break down. So this is the alveoli I'm showing here. This is the, like uh, uh, the alveoli you can see here surrounded by all those um, circulatory systems. And this is the alveoli wall that's truly uh, um, affected due to cytokine storm. As a result of that, as you can see here, the fluid accumulation build up in the alveoli. That shrinks the space for the gaseous exchange. So as a result of that, that fluid then rushes from the blood vessels into the alveoli and filling them up, blocking the exchange of the gases. When this happens, we cannot excrete enough carbon dioxide nor absorb enough oxygen, and it becomes much more difficult to breathe for uh, ERTS. Uh, how and why this fluid accumulation does happen then? The primary respiratory unit, as I mentioned, is the alveoli, are composed of single polarized epithelial cells. This is the like all those epithelial cells as you can see here. Um, that separate the gas field compartment and the pulmonary circulation as you can see from here. Right? That's the pulmonary circulation. This is the alveoli. And this alveoli is lined with all those kind of epithelial cells. Right? There are two kinds of epithelial cells. Um, and one of the main function of the alveolar epithelial cell is to control the ionic composition and the volume of the fluid at the surface of the airway and alveoli. So the alveoli always have a very small amount of fluid. If some reason is fill up with fluid, then we'll have very hard to breathe. For example, uh, many people who are suffering from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease due to uh, smoking, what happened? Their, epith their um, alveolar epithelial is disrupted and then so it get uh, accumulated inside the alveoli that uh, really uh, inhibit the normal gas exchange. As I mentioned, there are two kinds of epithelial cells lying in this alveoli, type one and type two cells. Uh, and this, the major function of these two epithelial cells to clear out the alveoli so that there is no fluid accumulation happen inside the alveoli. And maintaining this fluid layer in the alveoli depends critically on two important um, ions, sodium and chloride. And uh, the two proteins called uh, the inact protein, the sodium transporting protein, as shown here, you can see here, that does express by these cells, as well as the chloride transporting protein called chloride channel CFPR. People have shown that other chloride channel called CSCC that we are working on now. In fact, we just submitted to get some money from here NIH uh, to, to study the contribution of this channel protein on the fluid accumulation due to a uh, cytokine uh, storm. So as I mentioned, these, these two transport proteins are responsible to clear out uh, the alveoli. So the alveoli can uh, uh, help to normal exchange of between oxygen and carbon, di carbon dioxide for normal uh, breathing. What happened in uh, COVID-19 probably is that the cytokine, as I mentioned, we do not know which cytokine, maybe many of them, maybe one or two, uh, can somehow regulate this transport protein expression function probably sodium, probably chloride, you don't know. We are trying to explore it. As a result of that, they are not able to clear out the fluid from the alveoli. So therefore, the alveoli then uh, is flooded with the fluid, and then uh, it's going to affect the normal exchange uh, of 
oxygen and carbon dioxide. So that's very much happened due to uh, due to uh, cytokine for, uh, storm triggered by SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, now I want to uh, finish up here uh, with a take home message saying that COVID-19 patients have significant pulmonary inflammation leading to flooding of the pulmonary alveoli and this prevents normal gas exchange with the consequent hypoxemia and causes moral, uh, mortality. The direct attack on other organ by uh, disseminated SARS-CoV-2, the immune pathogenesis caused by the systemic cytokine storm, as like uh, what I mean to say here that that cytokine storm, other organs, for example, kidney, maybe um, mostly kidney or uh, maybe also uh, the heart. Uh, still, uh, people are trying to understand uh, what other major organ can be affected. Uh, by the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, a recent report has shown that it also affects the intestine. So people also suffer from diarrhea and vomiting um, from the SARS-CoV-2 infection. But that one is very infrequent. And you cannot see like uh, all of the uh, COVID-19 patients suffering from diarrhea, some of them. Um, also people uh, have found that uh, so, uh, COVID-19 patients suffering from hypertension too, probably uh, due to high blood pressure, because uh, I think you may remember that one of the receptors that I talked about is called SE2. So when SE2 is uh, occupied by this virus, then it may not convert uh, the two important enzymes called uh, angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, uh, and then from angiotensin 2 to other things. As a result of that, the angiotensin two level increase in the blood, and angiotensin two uh, is a is a is a peptide that can constrict our blood vessels. So when our blood vessel constrict, that can have an impact on high blood pressure. So that's happening in COVID nineteen patients. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, so far information available, effective antiviral therapy and measures uh, to modulate the innate immune response and restore the adaptive immune response are essential for breaking this uh, 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 vicious cycle um, and improve the outcome of the patient. That's why people are now uh, using dexamethasone is a steroid which has the anti-inflammatory effect, but it has also side effect, like it can uh, damage your kidney for long-term use of, of this uh, medicine. So still uh, not very clear what is the best treatment strategy for COVID-19. So this is my concluding remark, is that considering the recent outbreak of COVID-19 caused by the newly emerged coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 and the potential of future recurrence of SARS, development of effective and safe vaccine against SARS-CoV remains a high priority. But the big question mark is whether we are able to get an effective vaccine. That's the big question, million dollar question, because there is a history if you found that very few vaccine against virus really worked well or effective. Many, just for example, HIV, there is no um, vaccine. For example, rotavirus diarrhea, you remember that Indian government, Indian uh, Research Institute for this, um, vaccine against rotavirus, uh, only 50% effective. That's good at least, but that's a big question mark. Anyway, so that's all about, you know, I try to make it very uh, small and that's all. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any question, anything, please let me know. I'll try my level response. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaji. Yeah. For your nice presentation so now the presentation is open for the discussion so the audience please ask the question one by one there is a question from parvin alam in the yeah. chat box sir yeah why is diabetic and those with heart disease are more susceptible 
Yeah, that's a big question. What, I mean, what is the impact of the comorbidity? Um, to the severity of the disease, nobody knows. You know, it's very difficult to answer that question. But um, there is a contribution, definitely, of other um, uh, health condition that somehow drive the progressing of the disease. And in fact, in the morning, I saw one advertisement from here in the National Institute of Health. They're encouraging uh, for getting application uh, for grant, clearly mentioning the effect of comorbidity on SARS-CoV-2, meaning nobody knows what is the, why they are so susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, many reason, maybe they are weak immune system, nobody knows. Okay. Yes, uh, another question from Sikh Abid Hassan in the chat box. Yeah, so why are so many, so his question is, why are so many young people dying due to cytokine storm? That's a very interesting question. And again, it's hard. Uh, we do not know. Initially, people thought that young people are more, uh, you know, efficient to uh, defense this, uh, but that's not true. Now, uh, many people under the age of 35, um, and they are also, you know, uh, uh, have a, like, suffering from this disease. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, nobody knows. You know, people are trying to explore why. But very sure, cytokine storm is one of the important leading factors that really drive the progression of the disease. OK, Mr. Abit, uh, I, can, I can tell you uh, the interesting event. One paper just uh, published in uh, Science Immunology they showed also the cytokine storm. So in the human patient, so most importantly, the comorbidity like diabetes or heart attack or, or you know, cardiovascular problem, these people already immune compromised. That means their innate immune system, you know, the toll like receptor, non like receptors and inflammatory mediated pathway already been activated. So most of the cases, what they found that, you know, in case of the RNA virus, this is the RNA virus, which induced, you know, um, extrinsic pathway population, as well as they also showed there is a, you know, um, it's called the macrophage infiltration. Once the macrophage infiltrate inside these cells, they are become activate and they release the DNA RNA material. And that is called the sterile inflammation. And they activate the coagulation pathway, leading to called the DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation. Once started, no one can say it's a very difficult situation because the bleeding and clotting, everything started together. So here is a, this paper is very interesting paper, and another group from the Harvard they also presented uh, in a webinar. You can read this paper. Uh, all the people, it is the, and, uh, just came in the last month. I will upload in uh, the base uh, website uh, or WhatsApp group. This is from the Wilson uh, group in the NIH. They showed in the you know, the, in a human study. Go ahead. Any more question? Yeah, there are some questions I found. Why is diarrhea suddenly a part of COVID-19 symptoms? Um, yeah, that's, oh. it's very infrequent, you know, in COVID patient. It's not like you are getting uh, like 80% of the COVID-19 patient have this kind of symptom. But, uh, you know, three point, I, I have found that is 5% patient have this kind of symptom. So, Again, angiotensin uh, 2 level, as I said, you know, is, can increase because of the occupation of the AC2 receptor by this virus. So they are not able to or the degrade the angiotensin 2 to some other metabolite. Once angiotensin 2 level increase, they have severe effect of the transport protein in the intestinal epithelial cells, uh, mostly the chloride secretion. You know, my background is in diarrhea, and it is very... It is not very clear, but really angiotensin have severe effect on 
yeah, yeah, on the major uh, fluoride transporting protein that is being activated in cholera or in rotavirus diarrhea, nobody knows. But diarrhea happens in some few COVID-19 patients. It's not like most of the only 5% of the COVID-19 patients have this uh, kind of symptom. So well, one possibility could be somehow it is activating the fluoride transporting paired protein or sodium absorbing protein in it. I need to do this. Yeah, so there is another question. I don't know whether the chairman is going to read or do you want to read? And okay. What are the chances of recurrence after recovery? Mr. Yeah, that's a big question. So is again, whether it is severe condition, if, if someone is in a severely affected, chances are very low. Yeah. So that's the, the people who have the comorbidity uh, with other disease and get infection. They have very little chance uh, to recover and with, 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 um, in an older age. Well, there is a one, one more question uh, from Mr. Uh, Sahabuddin Sarawadi. His question is, uh, can we identify asymptomatic COVID-19 individual who are potential adult spread disease? Yeah. So, you know, that's the government is now trying to do some, you know, as I you know, uh, the PCR-based uh, in a technique, like right? polymerase reaction to look at certain gene expression happening in those uh, patients' uh, sample or not, in those people's uh, samples or not. So that's the only way people are not doing if, uh, even though they have that virus, but there's no symptoms, but still uh, they can spread that uh, disease. That's why people are, people are trying to find out how many patients have this uh, virus, how many people have this virus without any symptoms. So PCR based technique that people are now using. So I didn't know that. Well, another question came, what is the exact cause of death of COVID-19 patients? It is multifaceted. It is multifaceted, but the major major one is the overreaction of our immune system. And then that can lead to multiple effects with multiple organs. Uh, more specifically, that that cytokine storm may have effect on your on our vascular system, on our renal system, and of course our uh, our heart uh, circulatory system. So it's very difficult, like cancer, right? It's a multifaceted disease, meaning uh, factor responsible for the progression of the disease. The same thing happened here. So majority one is the overreaction of our immune system that can lead uh, to affect other organs. And the main, main, main one is the renal and probably cardiac. Well, another question from Ahmed. Uh, he, the question is about the recurrent, you know, recurring infection. What Why that, recurring uh, infection? Oh, it's a, I didn't get it. What is that? Maybe Recurring infection means once the individual infected and recover, then again he is yeah. getting infected. Yeah. So that's the um, uh, that's the controversy going on. That how long? So this is the uh, normal uh, uh, immune system uh, uh, meaning uh, react to infection. So when an infection happens, our immune system respond and then produce antibody for. Uh, and keep it there for future uh, defense. So in this virus, people have found in vitro uh, or you know, ex, uh, 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 condition they have found that uh, this virus produces, I mean, our Im immune system produces antibody against this virus, but that antibody do not stay for a longer time. So that's the big thing. So that means, uh, second time, when you get that infection, uh, our body cannot um, uh, tackle, tackle it by, uh, by, by the antibody because that antibody does not uh, stay in our blood for a longer time, like it happened for other disease. So 
the answer at this point probably you know there is a possibility uh, to have uh, the same consequences of covid 19 infection uh, uh, people like who are infecting with first time okay one question uh, from rehana khatun why are the current drug regime what are the current drug drug regime for sars cov 2 yeah <laughs> you know i am not a doctor but i always keep uh, my eye on you know what is prescribing what is being prescribed uh, for the disease mostly support system mostly support system meaning you know giving them oxygen and you know uh, so uh, dexamethasone people have found that that works but you know several uh, side effect they have found um and uh, remdesivir that's another um drug that people uh, that the company um, initially developed again for the evil ebola treatment but that didn't work for the ebola and then you know all the there are politics also going on because that uh, company uh, developed the drug for the ebola it didn't work so they invested a lot of money but they want that money back so what they have found they convinced the uh, authority to try with this drug and that didn't work too meaning they only decrease the um uh days of uh meaning hospitalization days so it has very minimal effect the the drug i'm talking about so it's not very clear uh the the right uh, that's why you know the whole world is working on it. all uh, uh scientists are working on it okay i want to just uh, little bit mention uh, the individual actually now there is people are using peptide analog like remdesivir you know favipiravir all kind of this nucleotide analog they block the nucleotide means you know uh, rna uh, replication that level and another guy i mentioned earlier the paper came in nature immunology they use the bruton kinase inhibitor that is mainly used for the lymphoma treatment but they use for the sars cov and they got a beautiful result and they published in uh, you know here science immunology and they are claiming that is the uh, same way the you know the lymphoid malignancy is occurred so you can read this paper so people are using different you know just use and trial someone is uh, you know more easy to be um recovered and someone not it's depend on the total immune system and physiological effect okay so here uh, mr mursid alam asked i have a longer question sir kindly allow me to ask through microphone okay go ahead please Yes, sir. This is Mushit. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Actually, sir, I I I would like to ask a longer question. That is, uh, whether uh, all our discussion here today is hypothetical or the uh, absolutely they are what COVID is. And and the question is that if they are hypothetical. then the effort uh, the scientists are trying to uh, manifest vaccine whether it will be uh, it will be good for the mankind or not if they are hypothetical how can a vaccine be made and another question is uh, how fatal it is uh, if you see the worldwide uh, data and status report then Uh, there are differentiation in the fatal rate in in india if you see uh, uh, then the scenario is very different uh, some media say that about is 3% uh, mortality rate it is about 2% or 1.5 or 6% and somehow uh, at if before yesterday i have gone through a letter i have gone through a editorial or something else that they say the genuine mortality rate is due and the other related question is that uh, if 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 symptoms are not very 
clear that whether seen uh, sorry whether the virus is uh, are very different and sometimes i think it got disconnected um do you want me to answer one of them or two of them i do not know yeah one by one i can answer one okay uh, you go ahead okay the fatality actually depends on the you know total genetic uh, genetic manipulation of the individual so what i told it is total the innate immune system if people are having the good immune innate immune system or susceptible then the fatality rate is less and how the immune system is working it depends on totally you know the geographical location suppose indian subcontinent the fatalities are less because the immune system are more, much more stronger in the innate immune system not the adaptive immune system innate immune system so that might be the uh, cause because immune system are much more stronger so they are you know after a while the immunity go up and the people will recover so that is the also a lot of people having uh, you know uh, the lot of scientists also if you go through the reviews a lot of reviews came from the china even thailand and all the places and everyone is saying asian having the less rate of mortality this difference might be the immune system uh let me add up something what dr gulshan said so i think if i understand correctly uh, uh his question i think he is uh, trying to understand that why some country has like you know a mortality or fatality rate is uh, Uh, low versus the other one for example in india so a mortality rate uh, you know is generally measured of the number of deaths in a population and is scaled to the size of that population per unit time for india we have huge number of population and if you calculate the number of deaths with a huge number of population then mortality rate you will see very low that's why you are getting very low in india <coughs> while in italy If you look at their population is so low and death rate is so high that's why their fatality mortality rate is so high so that's why is it is based on number of population like you know uh, i think it is kenya or something uh, uh per uh, i mean death per lack of population or something like that so that's why it varies from one country to other countries basically based on number of population Okay. Uh, here, one question. So many question is coming. Sunshine yeah. that day. What are the chance of recurrence after recovery? And if the recurrence happen, then it will be symptomatic or asymptomatic. <laughs> is there any doctor in our audience? I think they can answer that very well. You know. Meaning, I do not want to give any disinformation or misinformation. You know. <laughs> so yeah. I. Do Yeah, only only those people are working in the you know the uh, hospital and directly dealing with the patient. They can tell uh, exactly how much yeah. is the recurrence and what kind of recurrence is there, symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay. Um, here another question is uh, that Uday Shankar. So he's. how long covid 19 affected the people of india and when we recover from the infection and lead to a normal life uh, this is i think totally depends upon us as well as on the government if we do our part like keep social distancing wear masks then i think it will be controlled that's why you know in this country in usa still most of the university colleges is closed until unless you need to do something in the lab you are not allowed to be there and what i have seen in the road they are just writing in this um, um, you know sentences do your part 
and then the next sentence saying, you know, I will uh, like say, uh, maintain the safe distance, wear your mask, those kind of things, and definitely vaccine. So the vaccine is very uncertain. Yeah, so people are not. Until unless a vaccine is available, no. Yes, we need to maintain these two things: wear mask, keep safe distancing, and follow the rule imposed by the government. Might we we have to cross the finger within few months? Oxford, uh, you know, they, they have a uh, trial is uh, clinical trial phase three is going on. Hopefully, within few months we'll be um, get the vaccine and we'll um, get a normal life. Just uh, you know, just pray all. Otherwise, you know, vaccine should be uh, trial should be completed and uh, you know proper way. So another question is, if the character of all the virus is still to be determined, then on what basis scientists are trying to invent virus? What are the... Oh, yeah, that, you know, that's all about the, I don't know whether you guys know about it, the DNA sequencing, right? That's the, uh, the Chinese scientists first came up by doing DNA sequencing, sequencing of the new uh, COVID-19 virus when they found the DNA sequence of the virus is different from other two uh, viruses that cause epidemic, SARS and MERS. So by doing the sequence analysis and comparing with the existing virus, then they can come up with, okay, this is a new virus because they are DNA sequence different from other existing virus. And then they come up with the idea how that um, sequence differ from the existing ones. And for this case, they found the mutation in the spike protein. Okay. And they found that, um, you know, this virus has the highly uh, in a capable to mutate their own gene for their own survival. So, you know, when you, for example, in bacteria infection, you doctor prescribe some um, antibiotics, right? So when you eat that in antibiotics, what happened, the bacteria then recognize, okay, there is a new threat. Then the bacteria has a system that try to change the genetic material to resist the antibiotics. So how they do that? They do that, they basically mutate their own genetic material that will not affect by the antibiotics. So that's, they have the capability, you know, that we do not have the capability sometimes and it happens to us, for example, uh, in African country, you can see many uh, African, they have a uh, certain mutation uh, in their gene that uh, help them uh, uh, to die from the infection of the malaria. So that uh, is a kind of uh, a beneficial mutation for their own survival. So everyone, every living organism has a system to survive in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a harsh situation. So, so, you know, as I said, you know, uh, so new virus they identify by, by comparing uh, with their with the sequence analysis of the genetic material. Okay, so many questions is coming and... Uh... Professor Khan, there is a question in, uh, in the chat box, perhaps he did not notice it. Uh, is hot water uh, the question of uh, Sadaf Nur Kazi? Is hot water uh, drinking helps in preventing COVID 19? See, there is, uh, you know, <laughs> this is the interesting thing. Um, you know, initially, when the this uh, COVID came from the China, then uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, gossiping is going on. Okay, this virus is going to die in. Uh, 65 degrees centigrade. So if you can take the hot water, then it could be goes off. But the uh, problem is, you know, the you know the, the virus uh, membrane. They are mainly the you know, um, you know lipid bilayer. So to dissolve this bilayer, you definitely need 65 degree or more degree of temperature. But once you put in the, um, you know, in the throat, then throat is going to burn. The epithelial, even the endothelial cells are going to damage itself. So it is not a feasible way. 
then later on you know us scientists they told this is that's nothing this is not a, a reliable uh, no no there is no scientific evidence so that is kind of uh, you know there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding is going on and here is one question is called uh, let me add up something uh, what dr gosal khan um, talk about so in you know in nature what happened when we got infection we know our body increase our temperature right that temperature is actually um, not beneficial to the bacteria because our body always increase our temperature so that bacteria cannot replicate in that temperature which is higher than 37 degrees centigrade so what that you know like warm water even though if you take the warm water anyway the body is going to maintain always 37 so i don't think so the warm water is going to work I, you know but that's uh, from our you know the from our body natural system i can say probably is not going to work Okay, the uh, question is called Maidul Rahman. Do you think the corona is a zoonotic disease? Uh, uh, sir, uh, yeah. hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Uh, sir, actually, I have one, uh, I have one inquiry. Uh, actually, you have mentioned uh, corona has been transmitted from human to human. But as a history student, we have seen when the epidemic has happened in earlier, like uh, 13, 14, 1347s, like Black Death, Plague, and uh, Nipah virus. Most of the disease has transmitted from animal to human health. Okay, so do you think this disease has uh, transmitted from animal to human? So we can call uh, genotic disease. So do you think this uh, coronavirus disease as a genotic disease? Um, yeah. This is still um, very debatable. People are trying to find out whether this virus is in the environment, okay? And for example, in 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 cholera, you know, people think that uh, they can live in zooplankton in the sea when in the rainy season, and they are get activated, and then they can transmit it to the human. In coronavirus, nobody knows, but it is very clear that is jumped from the bat to the pangolian and then from pangolian to human. That's very much true. And they concluded this thing, this transmission, when they uh, 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 did the DNA sequencing of coronavirus uh, isolated from bat or pangolin and I found very much similar. And they concluded it is transmitted or jumped from bat to pangolian and then from pangolian to human. There's a very early study came out in Lancet, I remember, and England Journal of Medicine, two very important high impact journal in the field. And they have found the first reported the sequence of uh, COP2 isolated from a uh, human lung and compared with other two um, uh, sources. But whether it is genotic is very, very difficult to say at this point. Actually, one article just came in Time International. I uploaded, in, uh, you know, I to, uh, tell the people to upload uh, and distribute to you people. And 64, they try to uh, find out the zero patient number one. Even as of, uh, you know, very difficult to understand who is the patient number one from China. Very interesting story. You can read the article in Time International. So it will, uh, you know, a lot of things is coming day by day. Okay, another that people are using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, how much is affected our health? Hello? I think that you use beyond uh, the limit, definitely a high have toxic effect. But at this point, you have to again analyze cost-benefit effect, right? For example, coronavirus, you know, is a huge benefit by using a uh, sanitizer, you know, or 20% alcohol because they have found the alcohol somehow uh, 
uh, help them uh, uh, or innovate the transmission, you know, from hands to uh, uh, to our respiratory system. So at this point, I would say you have to decide. That probably, you know, uh, seventy percent alcohol may not have that uh, deleterious effect. Okay. Uh, hopefully, uh, another question came from again. Actually, it's a big question. Uh, okay, the, he is asking how much RT-PCR test is sensible. Is it not hundred percent sure? What is with <laughs> the wrong treatment of the uh, comorbidities? Yeah, it is very sensitive method PCR. Yeah. You know, uh, again, um, uh, important also how you are collecting the sample and enriching them and then ready them uh, for testing PCR. PCR itself, real time specifically, the real time PCR, which is fluorescence based technique and very sensitive. Meaning, if you have very minimum concentration in the sample, the system, uh, the technique is going to uh, pick it up, whether it is there or not. It is very sensitive method. Okay, hopefully, um, Dr. Kaji answered all the questions. And uh, thank you very much for this interesting <laughs> lecture. And we should uh, give a thanks to Dr. Kaji. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, before before signing off, we, we would like base would like Professor Abu Talib Khan to speak something. Okay, go ahead, sir. Can you listen my voice? Yes. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. I have uh, listened the lecture from Dr. Kaji, and it is ex excellent. And all the uh, participants who have attended the lecture, I express my sincere thanks to all of them. And BASE is doing excellent thing for the communities and the scientists. We must encourage this thing for benefit of the people. And frankly speaking, uh, everybody worried about COVID-19. The fact is that exact reason and other thing, we are speculating all these things that uh, due to uh, using mask and sanitization will prevent all these things. But still it is ambiguity that is going on for only precaution we are doing that. This is my own perception. But uh, I don't know vaccine will come very soon chemistry required for that. They are also working and hopefully by N2020 we should get new vaccine and we should come back in normal life again. And that is we are praying for all actually. So I got opportunity to see Gausal here and many other new colleagues. They are much younger than me. But we, some of them, will do very good in their own academic careers and benefit for this. This is my best wishing for all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, now I would like uh, the vote of thanks to be given by Faith. Uh, thank you, uh, Abidwai. Uh, good evening to all of you present here. Am I um, audible? Yes. 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 
okay so first of all i must um, say thanks to base for giving me the opportunity to deliver vote of thanks on behalf of base bengali academia for social empowerment i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our today's speaker uh, today's esteemed speaker dr mirazul haq kazi from university of maryland school of medicine who is kind enough to join us and deliver a, uh, a very much uh, informative lecture today and he made it so easy the difficult one easy to understand on this topic covid-19 cytokine storm impact on lanidima thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation and to deliver this important topic in the in this present context thank you thank you my pleasure <laughs> i would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks uh, to professor goshal uh, azam khan from fizi school of medicine fizi for uh, coordinating today's session uh, i must apologize sir uh, that we are really sorry to uh, disturb your sleep cycle <laughs> to disturb your circadian rhythm because we know that it is maybe 2 or 3 o'clock at night that you are here with us thank you so much sir my sincere thanks goes to base president vice president ds and all members who are actively working on it and bearing a lot of pain to make the lecture happening successfully uh, we are very glad to get uh, professor albut alev khan here with us uh, it is beyond our expectations sir thank you so much to be here and for your best wishes for base uh, last but not the least i i cordially thank all our wonderful participants who are constantly showing their interest on base and thank you once again all of you um there is one announcement our two tomorrow's lecture uh, number 22 is with the topic net set is easy a study of english language and literature speaker is sheikh sakir ali assistant professor midnapur college uh, it will be 7:30 pm tomorrow uh, onwards so thank you all for your patience hearing thank you thank you professor nargis ahmed madam so eta uh, program ta ekhani shesh hocche আমি পার্টিসিপেন্টদের রিকোয়েস্ট করব তাই সেশন ছেড়ে যেতে আই উড রিকোয়েস্ট অল দ্য পার্টিসিপেন্ট টু লিভ দ্য সেশন থ্যাংক ইউ